Hi, Lee. This is Sunku. Hi, Sunku. How are you? Hi. I'm doing good. Thank you. Good to finally talk to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sunku, remind me, is it, uh, wait, am I affiliating Intel with you correctly? Or am I? Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, I remember okay. right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. Good to talk to you. Yeah, I recently started working on Service Mesh and uh, so been ramping up on all these details uh, and also the community perspective of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah say more. Um, Oh, uh, yeah, so right now looking into uh, Envoy and, and its usage models and its performance aspects. Uh, so that's where I reached out in Slack, uh, join SMP and SMI. Uh, so uh, and it's all through the documentation that's been there, which I should say has been pretty well documented uh, on, on a lot of these things uh, compared to the other communities I've been pa part of in the past. So. <laughs> good. Good. Yeah, really good starting point yeah still in the learning phase uh, so trying to participate understand what's going on and um, and looking to uh, you know contribute going forward oh nice all right well uh you signed yourself up now now we uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think um yeah there could be some um symbiosis uh, happening um to the extent that that you that uh, uh, you getting engaged a bit helps give you a leg up on you know your your daytime focus like to, to help you sort of achieve part of your goals more quickly um, yeah, it could, could help and then at the same time help um, some of the projects actually we're going to talk about a couple of them now so mm. uh, and, and part of that it's funny funny that you mentioned it because part of it is about organization so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting to see NFE as one of the topic because that's the uh, that's been my background the last few years now, um, uh, and that's the uh, that's the space we're looking at leveraging Envoy, uh, for example, among other things. But yeah, so it's yeah, looking to see what what that discussion entails. Oh, nice. For, did you say? I'm sorry. I'm I'm doing like way too many conversations. Did you sure. say? Did you say performance? Uh, yeah, a NFE uh, as well. That's been my background, and yeah, I'm, I'm looking at some of the performance aspects uh, to start with. Uh, but yeah, uh, to understand performance better, I have to understand the stack. So that's where I am right now, learning the stack. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. 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 We we um, if we don't do it on this call, let's make a point. Well, let's make a point of. Uh, exploring a bit more like there's there's a number of things that uh for me to share with you i think that might might be helpful absolutely fair enough so uh, so yeah um amy i think yeah i'm not sure it didn't start recording on that's that. not good that's that's actually quite bad because these are all set up to be um uh, automatically recording however you're here it's good um i'm assuming that you all are canceling your meetings for the next two weeks because there will be no staff good, <laughs> good. um and we'll pick back up in january so <laughs> okay all right fair enough There's good a... I'm, it is recording now it seems like everything is working so <laughs> sorry yikes no uh, very good you know what it may be it like we we will see when we're done. Maybe it was recording the whole time, and I just couldn't tell. But um, that's fine. Uh, so fair enough. Um, well, we've got um, a set of a small collection of dedicated individuals on today's call, and we've got two other individuals who are um, slacking with me, and. Um, and I'm trying to get him to join the call because um, it would be easier to do it verbally. So, bear with me. Okay, very good. Um, okay, well, um, the good. Thanks. Um, Ken, very nice to see you. Frederick. Hello. 
Hey Lee, how's it going? Hey, uh, pretty well. Do we have um, any of the guys we're planning to present joining today? Um, there is um, um, Ian Wells from Cisco was um, wanting to talk about NFV and and so I invited him to the call. I, I'm not sure if he's going to join or not. Um, there's a couple of things, some how, a little bit of housekeeping, housekeeping around the work streams inside the service mesh working group to talk about. And since Frederick is here, there's a little bit to talk about with respect to SMI in general. Cool. And actually, um, Ken, Ken, since you're here, there's another topic that relates. Um, it, let me let me write it down. Which is the Wait, all the topics are surface mesh topics except for NFV. Um, okay, fair enough. So um, uh, thank you all. If anyone has any other topics, please feel free to list them because we'll, we will get through them. Um, so today is this December 17th. This is the CNCF SIG network call. Um, uh, jumping into the topics of the, the service mesh working group. And so as a refresher for, for most of us, um, that working group had been formed, um, I don't know, some many months ago. Uh, the efforts that have been given on those work streams have been presented the last couple of KubeCons. Uh, so we've given kind of an intro and a deep dive to, to those work streams. I'm highlighting a few of them. And, and really the, the first thing I think I wanna uh, ask about is, is a topic that we've had in the past and it's been, hey, for these more, for these deeper conversations, um, is there, I, you know, at the time we didn't know if it was um, appropriate to use this um, SIG Network's time to, to go through those. And we had decided like, hey, there's enough, um, there's enough room in the agenda to go deep on these. Um, and so we can, part of the challenge is that some of the folks who are critical to those meetings aren't able to make this time. And so Amy, one of the things that uh, that I wanted to, and, and you know, I've, I've struggled with uh, either suggesting that, that this SIG network meet at a different time or tossing out a separate meeting time for service mesh working group. Um, and I know we've got a CNCF calendar that overspills. But Amy, other than changing this, what, what, do you have a suggestion on whether or not we should change this, this meeting time and just use it to go deep on some of these projects? Yes, you should just use the meeting time that you have. Adding more meeting time is not going to improve the situation of calendar collision. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, no. No, yeah, the problem is some of those people can't meet at this hour. And so it might be- There's a conflict, that is separate. If we need to find a different time for this meeting, that is completely fine. Okay. I would just like to be consistent about when this group is planning on meeting so that we have a chance of being able to have some sort of like, uh, you know, show up every week at the, I don't know. Yeah. It's the, I, I'd like it to get us away from doing like one-off meetings. That was all. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. I'm still struggling there. So, so we'll, we'll probably send out a, a doodle or a, or a survey or a, a request for times. Um, so one one of the reasons why um, why this time is an inconvenience is, is based on time zones of the people who are working on um, a couple of things within here. So there's uh, un under this um, focus is is about performance and service mesh service mesh performance. It's about um, a, a few things: trying to standardize the way in which service meshes uh, and their workloads their, their performance is analyzed. It's not entirely about hard statistics uh, with respect to performance. It's also with respect to measuring the value that's being derived from a mesh and how it's being run, uh, which is to say how, how much you're asking a service mesh to do and how much uh, weight do you give, how much do you value those things is part of the conversation. Part of that same conversation is about distributed performance analysis. A lot of times performance analysis, at least in context of service meshes, is done from a single vector. 
So it's done by generating load against an endpoint and measuring the throughput and the latency of those responses and watching overhead in of memory and CPU and that kind of a thing. Well, then, and that's probably a fairly 1D perspective, a one dimensional perspective. And so there's been part of what that group has been working on is a 3D perspective um, is uh, of how to characterize the performance of different of your microservices and using a service mesh to do that. That effort is taking on a name, well, or is, is um, yeah, taking on a project name called Get Nighthawk. If you're not familiar with Nighthawk, it's the load generator for of the Envoy project. And so there's a few load generators out there, actually many load generators out there. The Envoy's Nighthawk load generator is, is becoming more and more popular. And that working group is trying to help it be so. It, it's creating a, a get Nighthawk, a, a number of distributions of Nighthawk and kind of a get Nighthawk dot, you know, um, dot IO project. So, so I'm, I'm covering this as a little bit of a review for those who might not have heard some of this before. Um, you can learn more about the, the projects at, at uh, probably at this first link on the slides. Um, so it is a call for participation, um, but it's also an acknowledgement that this time probably doesn't work for some of those that have been real interested. So earlier this week, we met with um, Microsoft, uh, a couple of folks at Microsoft, those that are working on OSM, and they're quite interested in participating in service mesh performance. And our, I think the, the project's probably bigger challenge has just been <laughs> finding a, a venue to, to have that meeting. And, and for my part, I've been really hesitant to bring that holistically to this, this meeting, because I feel like it, it would do a disservice to, or you know, going really deep on one thing and only talking about that thing would do a disservice to someone who wants to talk about core DNS or you know, ambassador or other things. Amy, that's been my personal challenge probably about guilt over like, uh, anyway. I should, no, I should um, uh, no, no reason to feel like upset about this. Um, uh, we are we are currently working on being able to figure out better processes for. Hey, how could we actually get projects that want to be incubating in? So, um, I mean, if you would like, I would put this on the SIG um, updates for January around help support the SIGs in this process. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It is, yeah. Nice. Um, okay. Um, the other thing. Hmm. Hmm. Here, here's a, another topic. It's about let's talk about service mesh interface a little bit. A couple of uh, couple of recent conversations with respect to the project. Um, and I think there's a, there's something of I had called a meeting with a couple of the maintainers um, this week to discuss how to breathe some more life into the project and how to, to help acknowledge that the leading service mesh um, or the leading service mesh by amount of adoption and Mindshare Istio um, as the, you know, the, trying to try to be uh, thoughtful with my words, but just as the, you know, as the, as uh, um, hasn't shown a lot of interest in SMI and having all of the meshes participate is most helpful to um, an effort like SMI to making it more useful in, in achieving its purpose. That's, that's, most, that's just a statement. And so um, how, how to help make sure that the current um, con SMI controller for Istio uh, continues to be up to date as Istio goes through changes. We're talking about how to, how to do that. Uh, talking about maybe adding some new specs to SMI or, uh, or minimally enhancing the ones that are there. So adding things like the ability to define a retry, to define a, circ um, a circuit breaker, uh, maybe a, to define how a canary would look like. Part of this ties into something that I've spoken to in the past, and that is that there are any number of service mesh patterns that 
that working group has been working on documenting. And, um, and a number of those patterns, like it, you would ideally be able to characterize those patterns um, in SMI, like in, in SMI parlance, like, hey, here's a pattern, here's how you could, here's how that would be um, fulfilled through SMI. Well, a lot of the patterns aren't able to be fulfilled through SMI based on its surface area today, the surface area of the API. So, so the discussion is, and the agreement was, you know, the, the land, the, those that are involved and focused uh, and have skin in the game, some of that has changed over time. And right now it looks like there's a number of people of the maintainers that are involved are ready to move some things forward. So, um, so and I, and for my part, I'm, I'm one of those. And so I, I think, um, so, so for most of the people here, this is this, uh, these updates aren't intended to be a monologue from me. So please interrupt. I'll try to pause as we're going. Um, they're all, I'm really giving part of these updates to say there's a lot going on in this, this, um, these work streams and organization of them and, and getting them like part of this is I'm sort of pointing the finger back at myself and, and kind of, um, uh, having Ken on the, the side of the line as well, where I'm, where we're saying, hey, there's a bit more organization for us to do to make to to bring some of these together, to like have consistent meeting times, to to make sure that we can we can meet and go through these and begin publishing some of these things. There's a bunch of well documented work that's been done around each of these work streams, but that, but it's not. But but for my part, I'm I'm. I'm I'm falling short, and, and so are some of the other um, people um, participating, falling short on getting the word out there um, that these activities are going on, because I, I happen to bump into a lot of people who are very interested in them. One of those is, uh, as a related note, is like a, the service mesh survey. Um, there had been, so Amy, you, you might be in a position to help uh, characterize this a bit more. Is Amy still with us? So some of you have seen, um, it's been, either been once or twice. There have been, um, the CNCF has done, a, yeah, there's a number of surveys. I'm not sure what the, the latest ones have been called, but they're basically usage surveys. And one of them had been about how different service meshes are being used and being adopted. And uh, was looking the last, you know, a year and something ago when I looked at one, it was, embarrassingly wrong. And I made comments about that uh, privately, probably. Um, and then there was some uh, recent chatter about another one that was published. And it was less embarrassingly wrong, but still quite wrong, or quite piss poorly done. And uh, as I went to go make a public comment about, uh, or I wasn't, I, anyway, as I went to go um, comment on that, I thought, oh, shit. People might think that the the service mesh working group or the SIG um, network might be responsible for that kind of a survey. Maybe we should get it right. And uh, in the service mesh in the SMI uh, biweekly meetings, there was an ask for to survey um, SMI users or potential SMI users for use cases like ones that that Frederick had, had recently mentioned. And so I took up an action item to help facilitate such a survey, I'm taking it through the SIG network here. So for my part, I think, I think it's high time that we do a real, an actual survey that there's, a, there's no doubt, and maybe December is the month, there's no doubt, and, and Ken, you may know, there's no doubt um, a, God, what was the CNCF uh, radar, the use, end user radar? end user technology radar that will eventually there will be done one done on service mesh and the clock is ticking and for my part i think that those can be kind of helpful things they're for the most part also not well done and i understand that those are hard to do yeah but we I definitely want to be involved in those i know that it's not a, it's not registered scheduled yet but we do want to definitely support that link Nice. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, can I, I, 
I, th I think a barrier had been recently broken down. At, um, uh, I've been invited to go to hang out on the end user call, uh, which is great because for my part, I want to help bring those use cases back to definitely the service. Yeah. And uh, so, so yeah, so I was just, so I'm going on public record to say that uh, I caught myself before I made a silly comment like, "Hey, this survey isn't well done." <laughs> And so, so maybe we should step up and do something. I, I'm gonna, if, if anyone's interested in participating and organizing this survey, comment here or comment verbally. Um, I think that the ones that have been done to date, they feel more damaging than they are helpful. Cause that, cause we've got things like, are you using this project name and turns out that project isn't even a service mesh or like and so so i do want to point out that ian has joined us and uh we had missed him in the start of the conversation and so uh i just want to point that out in case we want to revisit the nfb stuff yep He's um, I'm, I'm here mainly because Lee wanted to know whether I was going as gray as fast as he was, and the answer is easily yes. <laughs> wisdom, it's all, it's all wisdom. Just to come. <laughs> yes, Gen that or genetics, one or the other. Um, yeah, if we want to talk NFE again, I would very much like to have that conversation. Please. Um, which, which is obviously way off the top of service meshes, but uh, a topic of service meshes. But to be fair, that's that's part of the thing. Well, the reason I want to raise this here. Um, Ian, how's it going, man? Long hey, time. Ken. It's been a very long while, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, we're all here. this this is the ex Cisco convocation. That's really quite disturbing. Um, so NFE, um, as a general statement, is trying to make things that usually end up, not exclusively, but usually end up in service provider networks, things that are trying to do, you know, treat network traffic as sort of raw packets or um, do weird things with weird protocols because, you know, service provider standards are generally weird. Low level, more low level networking than you would normally find in Kubernetes. These are the things where, that I'm trying to deal with. And, and to be fair, there, there's a lot of people from different companies also interested in this for obvious reasons. Um, and um, the puzzle that we have, which has been tinkered with, but I think not necessarily solved in um, the Kubernetes world is that we want things from networking that CNIs and therefore service meshes built on CNIs are not providing. Um, and the reason for that is that the CNI's job is to simplify developing conventional applications. And the sort of things we're talking here are anything but conventional with their use of networking. We all know that networks, networking is made of packets, but most of us never actually have to give any thought to that because the, the BSD socket API we consume is not relevant to you know, the packets that are broken out. Um, so the problem we have here is that the CNI, again, is nearly 100% of its users it is delivering exactly the functionality that they're looking for. And again, the fact that when we want extensions, we can just build on top of it with a service mesh um, says to me that it's doing the right job. So the question I'm left with is, firstly, can we enumerate our requirements on the NFE side of things, the things we want to do without regard to the solutions like CNI out there um, to actually say, if we can do this, then we can get our job done. The second question is, What's the best approach to getting those things done when we're working, when we're trying to make an application run on top of Kubernetes? And my feeling here is that the more we try and bend the CNI to the will of a very small minority of use cases, the more we're doing the wrong thing. So um, but that's a personal feeling. How it, the, the, the general question is, if I want to run a network function that plays with packets, the other network function I want to concern myself with is if I want to run a network function that consists of multiple um, routing domains, VERFs on the network, uh, how can I get those things to work in Kubernetes and what would I need to change? Just to, for, for more context, Ian, is um, 
is part of the the use cases and, and the conversations that you've been having to date have those any of those been in and around the network service mesh project um i was up there at the start of the network service mesh um ed took it and run with it but it was me and him and kyle who had the original idea so yes um the original idea of nsm was something a little bit more raw than it's turned out to be um and i think it might have a um, potential part of this solution although as i've seen it develop i think it's developing more in the direction of cloud to cloud connectivity which isn't our problem in nfe it's actually more dealing with things like wide area networks controlled by independent operations teams who would like you not to stuff up their network and get them in trouble um, who would also like to say that them playing with their network is not stuffing up your application and getting it in trouble. So um, the it and the NSM use case don't seem to gel quite as things stand. In fact, my feeling is, my suspicion is that in much the same way as you've got a CNI and then you've got a service mesh running on top, NSM fills the role of that service mesh in raw networking, but there isn't an underlying layer there. And there's a more basic question of how it should be dealing with the network at the lower level. Um, that we're, is the one that we're missing right now. Is uh, again, <clears throat> again to to like to just help characterize the problem statement or like part part of the question that you're trying to is would it be a mischaracterization to say that um, that you're in search of extending CNI's surface area? I want. What I think is a, a far enough different kind of networking that it's probably not sensible to add it to the CNI, if we're being honest, in much the same way that I don't try and make block and object storage answer to the same APIs. I don't think these two sorts of networking should answer to the same APIs. A little bit towards that as well. There, there have been years worth of efforts to try to extend out CNI scope from a variety of different parties. and. Uh, CNI remains uh, mostly unchanged in, in this respect. So uh, I even, I, I agree that I, with, with Ian, I don't think it's the right approach anyway, but even if we thought it was the right approach, the chances of getting your community to accept anything in that area is, uh, makes, makes the point most likely uh, moot anyway. Mm. It, it doesn't, again, when you consider firstly the, you know, the kind of networking we do is way off the wall compared to, you know, anything that your average Netflix or whoever is going to do for a web app or similar. Um, it, it, it's, you know, dramatically different to that. Um, then trying to combine those two things into a single API leaves you with all the complexity that we might need thrown into, you know, all of the standard use cases that don't use it. I, I don't think it's going to make anyone's lives happier. Um, yeah, and, which I'll, is... I'll, and I'll sum up the contract in a, in a phrase. Um, I, I, it's an API that when you call, you say, please, please add networking to this uh, network namespace, Linux network namespace, and tell me what IP address you, you chose. Tell me what, what interface name and IP address you chose. Uh, and that's it. They're not even the subnet. Like it's, it's very, uh, very, very minimal down. Uh, so it's, it's focused around pure, pure L3, uh, connectivity for landing uh, an interface into into a pod, and uh, anything beyond that uh, is uh, not part of the technically not part of the spec. Like there's there's people that will drop things like oh let's do something with SRLV, let's do something with with MPLS, let's do something with with only Ethernet or so on. These are technically all out of out of spec, uh, and they're running into the same problems that Neutron ran into earlier on, which is that uh, Neutron did not meet their needs. And so they ended up co-opting things like, oh yeah, this MAC address label, that's an MPLS label instead. Uh, and until they worked out, they could actually get underneath to the, uh, to the underlying uh, uh, rabbit and queue uh, and inject their own messages in. And then hmm. that and became a nightmare. Uh, yeah. and so what it comes down to is without necessarily judging what the implementation is going to be, whether it's going to be the CNI or not, but at least bearing in mind that it might not be. Um, what I'd like to do um, is I'd like to make sure we've got some degree of quantification of the problem statement 
rather than the solution, because this is one of those problems that you tend to find. People are basically saying, I see these open source projects, they've been out there for so long, they must solve my problem. Um, I, I don't think people necessarily appreciate how different their problem is. So I think it's more, uh, there's an element of just defining what would be a working solution, how I would know if a solution was enough for what I wanted. Um, and then, you know, kind of exploring some of the more perhaps off the wall options than, than again, trying to adapt the CNI to make this work. Yeah. One question here. Um, some of these requirements uh, are being discussed by service providers and, and operators and uh, mm -hmm. CNTT or what's going to be on the kit, for example, the reference models yeah. or their CNF working group uh, yeah. CNCF. So how um, so are, are we talking about requirements from there that we could address uh, via CNI or outside of CNI or? Well, I, I'm, I'm here in part because I've been involved with the CNF working group, but I just want to be clear about an audience problem that we have here. Um, we talk as if service providers are our audience for this level of feature, and that's simply not true. The people who consume APIs that do networking are the people that write applications that do networking. Service providers then try and run those applications, but service providers don't generally, I mean, there are exceptions to every rule, but service providers are generally not the authors of those applications. So if we jump in and say, that a group of service providers, um, like for instance, the telco user group or CNTT, which is service provider dominated, are going to you know, come up with the right thing to make an application run. We are, it, it's the tail wagging the dog in much the same way that Kubernetes APIs were developed by people who were writing applications. These APIs first and foremost need to satisfy the people who are writing those applications. And then as a secondary factor, they also want to satisfy the requirements of um, network architects. Mm -hmm. Or more accurately produce results that make network architects happy. It's probably not the APIs themselves, the architects are calling, but yeah. So, so I guess then the question is like, um, how, how do we capture those requirements and uh, ha have a um, have a uh, solution, for lack of a better term, solution via CNI. Is is that the kind of question we're discussing here? Uh, are we How saying to, uh, CNI might not satisfy? Yeah, we, we we are. What well, right? This is a judgment. Um, firstly, we define the problem before we start saying how it's solved. But my my best guess here is that whatever that solution looks like, it's so far removed from what the CNI does today that it would make more sense not to mingle it with the CNI. But that is um, a best guess. It's not necessarily true right now. Until you know what the problem is, we can't say what the answer is. Yep, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and to be clear, another thing in terms of CNI is there's also a northbound and southbound API issue. So one of the problems you run into is, well, what problem are, are you trying to solve? So if you're, if the problem you're trying to solve is I want to get multiple interfaces within a pod, then uh, a, uh, a CNI approach yeah. uh, may be okay because you could do like a CNI multiplexer. Uh, one of the one of the problems that CNI multiplexers tend to run into is that they're commonly configured through a custom resource. Uh, and they bubble up the southbound CNI API to the northbound, which means that if Kubernetes ever decides they want to change the CNI spec, that uh, those low-level details have been have been exposed. Uh, and it also means mm. that the uh, many of these uh, the subnets and similar and uh, or uh, parameters like what uh, uh, like VLAN uh, VXLAN. Uh, parameters and so on often get welded into those um, as well rather than negotiated. So, let, so you, let, we, we do want to be careful there. Let, let, let's, uh, it's interesting what you've just written down, Lee, um, because um, I'll come to that in a moment. But, but starting from what Frederick's just said, right? If we look at something like Multus, right? It said that A, CNI networking, the CNI networking API is largely adequate to the task. It describes the sort of networking that we want. And then it said, but the only problem here that we used to be able to do with virtual machines and we can't do with containers, which we can't get multiple interfaces into a single container. Now, there are flaws 
with both of those statements. Statement one to one, number one, that CNI gives us the kind of networking we want, which is that um, there's a single network domain, it is layer three addressed, it's all about reachability, um, that there's one egress from the cloud that I use for, for the networking that's coming across the CNI. Literally none of that is true in terms of NFE. I want multiple points of egress from the cloud. And the only reason I have multiple interfaces in a container is because that's the only way I can point at different points of cloud egress at the same time. Um, then we get things like, whenever we get into this, it always seems to turn up with IP address management. I don't always have an IP address and it doesn't always reside on one interface. I might be doing things like um, ECMP load balancing. So my interface, my, my address migrates. I might be doing MPLS where I don't have an address at all. So all of these assumptions, it's easy to find a use case that invalidates them. And then finally, that namespace thing, um, I am trying to get multiple interfaces into my namespace. Actually, no, no, I'm not. Literally don't want two interfaces in the namespace. That's exactly the thing I don't want. I might want them in two independent namespaces. I might want one of them to be a pass-through interface, but I absolutely never want two interfaces in the same namespace. Yeah. yeah. By, by the way, tying this to um, to the layers as well. So most of these are at the L2 and L3 layers, and we have mm. people who are service mesh experts here. Uh, so one of the one of the things, one of the challenges as well that we that we need to look at is uh, is how to build in these things so that they complement each other. So in other words, uh, most uh, service meshes focus on the L4, L7, managing PCP sockets, managing uh, application uh, related things like HTTP or gRPC or similar. And uh, at this particular level, uh, you're looking at how do you actually establish that initial connectivity? Like you have multiple clusters, how do you establish connectivity between those clusters? Or maybe a uh, clusters with connectivity to external systems uh, could be a VPN to a client or, or a partner. Uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, telecom, it could also be how do I establish connectivity across multiple sites now that we're starting to see edge data centers start to start to come up, and how do we ensure that we don't get things like IP conflicts or localize the uh, things that were originally global and still trying to localize them. Uh, and these are problems, do domains that are outside of the standard service mesh, but they have they have massive impact on on the service mesh space, uh, depending on the type of service that uh, that is provided. Uh, and the ideal state is that it's fully abstract again, that you don't have to worry about those low level details as long as like you know how to connect to something that it, that it just works. Uh, but we're not at that uh, at that state just yet. And so, uh, just just some just some thoughts as well, because I want to make sure it's relevant to to the people who are uh, who are on the call as well. So, so you need both, is what I'm saying. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You totally do. As a matter of fact, you know, this, there's an, any number to your point, um, Frederick. There's any number of like um, sort of core service mesh use cases that. Um, that when you have a service mesh to, as it's defined today or as it's commonly spoken to today, when you have a service mesh discussion, um, uh, don't, they don't go low enough to realize, they don't go low enough so that you can actually realize a number of those value propositions uh, because the way that you would deliver those value propositions is by use of um, lower layer networking or um, or or yeah. things that aren't just and, um, and, I, and I would argue that they shouldn't drop down to that level as well because they overcomplicate the uh, the solution and they start to make assumptions uh, in in the space and so uh, it's better to keep a uh, loose coupling and keep that abstraction um, and, but the problem with it is that all all these abstractions uh, end up being leaky in, in some areas so you end up making some uh, some requirements somewhere. Um, one thing that will help in this particular space is 
there's right now if you if you look at how at what the underlying assumptions are the underlying assumptions are primarily around um net, networks are the identifier of who you are and ip addresses are the identifier of, of who you are and when you establish a, a service I, like one problem that i ran into and this actually was on an enterprise not a not a telecom side but we'll see the same problem arise on, on telecom and service providers, uh, again, especially with, with edge data centers coming along. And so I had one, uh, I, I had two companies I was joining together. One of them was on Google, another one had a major on, on-prem solution. One side said that they, uh, they had a range of IP addresses they were able to use. The other said that those range of IP addresses were completely taken, you're not allowed to use them and, uh, and join them. And the cloud prevented uh, it was using Google at the time and, and Google prevented them from making use of, of other sets of, of addresses. That particular system took around six months to resolve because of IP conflicts and firewall rules that had to be set um, and had to be mitigated. And this problem is not uncommon. The, the average time with uh, many large organizations could be literally qu several, several quarters just to establish that initial connectivity. And so the implications on that are, are huge. And so when we start looking at things like application message uh, and large enterprises tend to, they actually look like service providers because they're service providers for their BUs and they manage the infrastructure for their BUs. And so these problems are, are not isolated only to, to telecom. Uh, but one of the things that I strongly recommend is not using the network or IP address as the identifier anymore because that's now dynamic. We now have overlap. We have, uh, it, it, makes the, it, it makes the infrastructure, uh, when you bind identity to it, it makes, you're, you've welded the security and the infrastructure together in a way that uh, makes it uh, brittle. And so one of, we have within most service meshes, um, uh, the spiffy identities or, we have cryptographic identities we're able to use. So binding against the identity against those trust domains is a much stronger proposition because I could say this trust domain and that trust domain, we can federate them together. And it doesn't matter what IP address they move to. We can say, yeah, that's using 10 dot something. It's using one IP two, it's using a public address. Don't care, Show, prove to me who you are based upon that cryptographic certificate across, uh, across trust domains. Uh, one of the problems you run into is that the service meshes don't tend to implement the federation portion of security. They, they implement the workload API, but not the, uh, not the federation portion of API, which then complicates the federation of, of, these, of these identities. So by providing some form of federation, whether it's allowing your system to, to run with Spire uh, and building against Spire or uh, building the Federation API out yourself, which is not a complex API. Uh, it doesn't fully solve the problem, but it, it gets us a, a major step towards that level of independence. And then that helps separate you from those L2, L3 concerns. And that means we could even drive you to a different protocol, which could be non-IP based. You don't care because you've asked for something. As long as you can get that socket to what you need, you've maintained that, uh, that independence. So th does that make sense? Oh, a ton. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the day had, the day had long passed since, um, it was appropriate to use an IP address to identify much, or at least, at least in, in my area of focus. And, and, um, when you said Spire a moment ago, was, were you using that interchangeably with an, an SVID? Like, or let, let me, let me say it like this. That I'm, I'm, I'm being, uh, I'll, I'll being uh, I'll, I'll be very specific. Uh, uh, so Spire is a is a reference implementation of Spiffy. Uh, there's two APIs. You have the workload API that pushes down that you send uh, uh, SVIDs down, and then there's a federation API, which is how do you actually join things together? Uh, how do you join together multiple trust domains? And so Spire is a reference implementation, it doesn't have to be Spire. Uh, I'm bringing that in as an example because it, it fully implements both sides, but uh, it, it, could be, it could be Istio or it could be Kuma or be something else. As long as those federation uh, APIs are adhered to in the Spiffy spec, because Spiffy is the, is the spec, then uh, that, uh, that gives, 
th that that would help tremendously towards getting us towards the, the multi towards the multi cluster approach. Yeah, this is actually something that we're really interested in on the council side here about wondering like what is the status of other service meshes interest in either like the federation spec of spiffy or uh the hamlet spec that was proposed by vmware and seems to have kind of like lost steam over the past like year to six months um it's definitely something that we're looking at for internal use cases of uh federating like console servers with uh, console deployments with other console deployments independent that are independent uh but we're definitely interested in hearing from other meshes about what sort of interest they might have in uh, those protocols. The, uh, yeah, uh, Mike, the, the um, um, Andrew Jessup or, or a representative of um, the Spiffy Inspire projects had wanted to put together a definitive list of which meshes have, are, have implemented Spiffy or have implemented um, Spire and any did so um, here as a reference under uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, under this section here under functional just there's a spiffy inspire section and so um, th that's put together the the, ye the yays or nays are well put together by a project, a project maintainer of uh, spiffy inspire and so, um, yeah, notably, and you know, Frederick is sort of probably hinting around this that one of the one of the more prominent service meshes doesn't you know doesn't necessarily um, use either of the two of those, or like sort of halfway uses um, mm -hmm. Spiffy, and that um, yeah. That if these were all green check boxes, I mean, one way of saying this, if if, if sort of the Spiffy column was showing a lot of green. <laughs> some, of, uh, some of the challenges that Frederick it was, uh, is articulating you know, begins to, and some of the power of, like in my mind, uh, while there are all kinds of non-technical concerns, you know, po politics to be addressed around the, the projects, uh, it's, it's a, as long as a service mesh as a technology makes it, so, so to speak, that it's an inevitability that Federate, you know, federation of these identities, of these catalogs, of these services is um, th that they're either SMI or maybe an NFVI or a or a Hamlet. Um, you know, needs to become a real boy, and and one place to, to sort of make it a real boy, if you will, is is here in this. Um, Forum or in this in the CNCF sort of in this forum, um, the those project maintainers had asked a couple of times about interest, and and we're we're interested. I mean, we're um, I think there. I know for a couple of the individuals that are involved from VMware that there were uh, it was pre pre release of uh, Tanzu Service Mesh, and they weren't feeling the love in the Istio Environments uh, Working Group, so to speak. Um, and we're feeling placated or we're being placated in the SMI um, community meetings. And between that, and I think, you know, just, yeah, I think that you've got an accurate sentiment as you characterize sort of where the project's at. By the way, yeah. some, some information on, on VMware, they uh, hired three of the top spiffy Spire uh, engineers and are having them work primarily on, on spiffy and, and uh, and uh, Aspire, um, and so the and that that was done uh, that that was done relatively uh, relatively recent. Uh, also, uh, not that they have a, a service mesh in the, in the game, but uh, HPE acquired uh, Cytale, which was the company that was driving Spiffy, and HPE has been doing a lot of work to continue that uh, the, those engagements. And they've been actively working with several service meshes to help with that uh, with that in the integration, including in some scenarios, providing uh, uh, manpower in some limited cases, uh, based upon their based upon that team's capabilities, because it's still a relatively new 
acquisition, so they haven't fully scaled up yet. Uh, so there's uh, so there are commitments from variety of groups. Uh, I've also had conversations with uh, with Red Hat, and they are they are interested in the they don't have a good federation story, and they are interested in this as a potential approach, which has some Istio implications. But there's I think the Istio one is going to come down to whether the governance has been sufficiently uh, uh, decentralized. Uh, because while it was being controlled by by Google, uh, it the 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 will just was wasn't there for uh, for some of these. Like they they knew they supported the the SVID downstream, but not the not the federation uh, portions. Uh, and so, it, I if if the governance is decentralized, we, there may be more more interest in this type of things because it, it helps with. Uh, with a broader set of use cases than than the initial scope that Istio was originally designed for, which was uh, only K Kubernetes cluster, because it welded. The, the big problem actually comes from where, where do you where do you root your identities to? Is do you root them to uh, to an individual cluster? Because right now the cluster is the is the uh, identity provider, or can you can you uh, weave it into a, a wider story? which as a company or as a business unit, you're able to control your identities regardless as to whether they're Kubernetes some, or something else and to provide that, uh, that integration across the, across the board. Um, and uh, again, going back to tying it back to the NFV portion, this allows us to treat NFV as a layer and we don't have to worry about, uh, from your service mesh side, you don't have to worry about, worry about uh, uh, about those low level details as much because you're not bound to a specific IP address. You're not binding to v a certain VXLAN protocol or, or similar, those are, those are all abstracted away at that point. Ian, uh, with the time that we have left the, of the goal that you were more or less attempting to accomplish in terms of like um, you know, raising up, you know, defining some problem statements, sort of identifying where a couple of these efforts, you know, are either after a different persona or after different use cases for those same personas. In your, how can we help, or uh, or what what would be ideal? Um, as either an outcome or sort of a set of work or, or you know. Let's try that without mute. Um, so that's, that's a good question. I don't have a straight answer for you right now. I just wanted to basically, I guess, terrify you um, about the kind of networking we're doing so that, you know, really to say that it doesn't matter what you do with service meshes, it isn't gonna solve this problem because it's a weird and different problem. It demands efficiency among other things, um, and and it's annoyingly low level and not really relevant to, again, most people's experience of what they're doing with networking. So I just want to basically raise the fact that there is a weirdness going on here. You know, the networking SIG, I don't want to hide it from you. I want to basically lay it on the table. Now, in terms of solving it, um, I'm working on that. I'm working with Taylor on that. We, we have the CNF working group. It doesn't currently belong to a SIG. It's not obvious that it necessarily wants to belong to the network SIG because it's not about networking in Kubernetes. It's about building a network function, um, and only and what Kubernetes needs to provide to, to do that is only one part of the problem. And it's also a little bit, um, it, it's everywhere at the moment. It's how do I make my how do I make my network functions cloud native? What is cloud native? What is an application? So it goes on. So um, it, it's a little bit cross-platform. Uh, really, I just want to basically lay the problem out so you can see we've got some work to do here. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get the right people in the room to talk about that because, again, talking to people who operate hypothetical network functions is well and good, but it isn't going to resolve the networking needs of, of Kubernetes to talk to them because they're not the ones necessarily writing those applications. Um, I think this will be an ongoing conversation while we figure out the structure of this, basically. I agree on all points. And I'm, to be candid, I'm, I'm confused as to like the CNF um, uh, conformance working group, like it is all about, I, I, like 
for my part, I don't need any additional work. So you know, happy not to, or not, I'm happy to have the working group here or, or not. Um, but it is like so much more about networking and even deeper sort of lower layer you know, service mm. provider centric networking than the SIG, uh, um, SIG app or the other. And, and granted it's cross function. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's it. There are other parts here. Things like, for instance, SIG app delivery could potentially be interesting, but um, on a fairly cursory read of what they're doing, then what they're doing is talking about applications that are delivered, including the Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is a part of the application. And again, that turns out to be a use case distinction between what service providers would like to do and how most people use Kubernetes. Most people are interested in running one app on their Kubernetes. That's fine, right? Controlled by the app team because it's helping them. Service providers want to basically make this an independent component that they look after and they run multiple CNFs on it. So if we are doing something different than, than the familiar pattern that's well studied, I think it's important that we get people who are thinking to do that to recognize the distinction between what they want to do and what everything that has been done before because the immediate conclusion they come to is, really it must work. And all I have to do is go and pick and choose the components off the shelf and figure out which ones make it work. And that's sometimes a flawed assumption. Sure. Nice. Um, other, other comments on um, problem statements that Ian has, has documented? I think, both, by the way, I'm Frederick and Ian, both of you guys, like the way that you, you characterize the, the differences of these layers is, um, is uh, nuanced. And I thought, I think um, very accurate, like, and the, the nuances are quite meaningful. Or like <laughs> there's, it's a deep, it's a big old, and this is why, why this is why earlier when we were opening the call and I was talking about the service mesh uh, working group and some of the things that it's doing, the where I was trying to express a feeling of potential guilt was to like go deep and focus on one of the advancing one of those initiatives using this hour because networking as a thing is fast, broad, wide. Mm. And so, um, but uh, you might view this as for networking as a whole. How mm -hmm. do we make um, uh, the important things easy and the hard things possible? Um, and arguably the CNA might makes a lot of important things very easy and service meshes make even more important and comparatively complex things easy. But the CNI as it stands denies the possibility to make the hard things possible. But so there's a little bit of something that needs to be broadened out in that direction. And since again, nearly 100% of Kubernetes users have no interest in doing hard things, it's completely understandable that's where we are. Um, but unfortunately we're awkward. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, right, there's a number of um, related problem statements that that I would probably add to this list that are from a, a layer seven centric um, pr mm. perspective, where, where we're saying where I would I would say that the application and its needs are under characterized in in layer seven land to be able to bring forth, uh, to facilitate for those needs a bit more programmatically or a bit more automatically. And um, things like, not exactly CNAB, but things like um, op open application uh, model, o OEM. Uh, OEM. Lost with your terms, but where, where are you going with this? Well, is that, um, there's a lack of a the lack of um, application uh, lack of a complete definition of what a workload is, what it, it like what it is, yep. what it needs, what it depends on. Does it need multiple paths out? Like, and if there are, how, why would it prefer one versus the next? Sort of, we consider like uh, things about affinity or anti-affinity. In um, yeah, yeah, you you've got it, it's sort of interesting. I, I think what's happened here is that. We don't really talk at the level of a workload. We, we talk at, you know, again, if I'm Netflix, right? Um, and I'm sure this is not how they run on many levels, but if, if I'm basically running a, an as a service offering with Netflix, be it Salesforce, be it anyone else, right? It isn't a matter of running 
multiple applications. I'm running literally one application. I've broken it into components that I'm trying to divide up and give to people to manage them separately. But I only have one application. I don't really have to think at the application level because it is my literal job description. Um, when you start asking yourself, well, how, what happens if I'm running many of these things simultaneously, not microservices, but actual self-contained applications, or I want to run it in one cloud, then you actually don't have a description of what an application is and what it touches and what else it might want to communicate with. Because a lot of these things like policy of how microservices communicate um, and the security you put in place there and the metrics of how microservices communicate that are relevant to the person running the application and maintaining it are also interesting to the guy who's using multiple applications because now they want to know how these applications are interacting with each other. But actually the internal communications of the application is a black box, right? It's happening, get stats out. They mean nothing to me because I don't know what conversations this thing has internally. So um, we haven't got that higher level of abstraction today, certainly. Has it yeah, been? there's, there's a, a part of what uh, needs to be considered in this space as well is uh, how do you provide enough information for these infrastructure components to be properly scheduled by, by the orchestrator? And so it, right now it's, it's, it's a black box, but even the parameters on, on what the system supports is, is still a black box and not well, uh, mm. not well abstracted. So in other words, to, if I wanna run a, a bump in the wire firewall, this thing doesn't have an IP address. It doesn't care about uh, load balancers or anything like that. Uh, but when I, when I install it into Kubernetes, I need to know Okay, well, what what protocol is this thing going to use? Is it an Ethernet based one? Is it IP? Is it something else? Uh, so, what what is its payload? And mm -hmm. the second thing is, how do I actually communicate with it? Like, do I speak with it over a kernel interface? Is there a shared memory thing I'm going to drop in? Is there a device I'm going to drop in that it knows how to communicate over? And so, it needs to be able to describe its capabilities to the northbound so they can get scheduled in. Now, whether it's Kubernetes or something else, uh, I, in the ideal world. Uh, shouldn't matter, uh, but uh, you know, a, there's right now there, there's not a good description or definition of what these things look like in, in a way that we can meaningfully consume them. Uh, mm -hmm. Despite the fact we have all these different efforts to define, okay, well, what is the infrastructure for this? Like mm -hmm. uh, that the, this core problem still still remains uh, <laughs> not untouched, but but unsolved. I, it, some of these things, again, if if you consider effectively, you've got a um, at the lowest level of this networking, you've got a broad but dangerous um, level of abilities. Um, you can do whatever you like almost with the networking, but most people will shoot themselves in the foot if they try and join in at that level. And at the highest level, you've got something which is narrow and prescriptive, but generally doing exactly what you want to do with no additional value, no additional craft, like, again, service meshes trying to deliver particularly specific functionality that help applications. It's possible that if we stuck that lower level in there, we would suddenly find more flexibility at the higher levels as well. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily exactly related, but the one that always comes to me is the fact that Envoy is effectively running privilege because it's doing dirty tricks with the, um, with the networking that aren't strictly permitted by the CNI. And arguably um, a related question of, well, what networking is the CNI itself consuming? Um, you know, if there's a CNI plugin, how does it attach to the outside world? Is there a potential for, for more things there? So. It, it's possible that what we're doing here would bring value. It's not the first place I'm trying to go, but I'm certainly not saying um, this is all on a on a, another avenue all by itself and it doesn't tie back in. By the way, the OAM looking at the networking portion, uh, I, I think is binding on the wrong thing because you're binding on a subnet and for, for your application and you pass in a, a subnet ID for uh, for how to connect it in. Uh, and this had, this is this should have nothing to do with the application itself. The application should not ask. I need to be on this specific subnet in order to in, in order to communicate. Uh, that mm. that's something else. There is a place where you need to describe these these properties, but it should not be in the application definition itself. 
it, it's so, weird this 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 is one of those things where we always like to talk about immutable infrastructure and if networking is infrastructure then indeed it's immutable but if you're a part of the networking then it's not infrastructure it's just you know more functionality existing elsewhere and in no sense is it immutable so when we talk about network functions since they're going down to the lowest level then they start choosing their addressing they start choosing their mac addresses sometimes they certainly start choosing protocols that are not ip and that's where you know a lot of these standards like oh well you're an application of course you'll want to subnet and figure out what to do with it that isn't actually how this works once you've got to that level Correct. And there's also the question, do I even want a subnet? Like if you look mm. at Calico, uh, Calico networking is not subnet based. It's actually, uh, everything is a slash 32. So yeah. the concept of a subnet in Calico uh, is, uh, I'm not gonna say it's completely meaningless, but it's, uh, it, it's not what you would expect. Sounds like you've got another meeting to go to, Frederick, if you don't like what they've written in this OAM spec. Yeah, I, I do have, well, I'd say I have to jump onto another call right now. So um, not an OAM one, but uh, possibly. I, I can only see sound so many though. So I'll, I'll see what I can do about that. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, if anyone is interested in the, the link to that call, um, uh, ping me, I'll send you a link to the, the call to uh, get the overview of OAM. But, um, and I don't know that it, I, I, I'm not suggesting that it captures or provides a facility to capture all of this. It did look at first blush fairly uh, like it had considered for quite a bit. So, yeah, it, if you look at it from something like, like build pack, like saying, uh, what do you want to connect to? Well, there's a database that I'm going to call uh, that I'm going to give a, a name, but that name is not a is not a. It, it's a top level request. It's not act. It's not the actual binding. It's like I need to connect to my Postgres service. Whether it actually renders to an internal Postgres or some external one, uh, a, a hosted in cloud version, you don't care. You're saying that the protocol is Postgres, and you need to communicate to something that speaks that. And so having a Having a system where you can describe, I need to have a relationship with a service within the spec, I think would be would be excellent. Uh, and how the system renders that into it, uh, it's the same advice that I gave to, uh, originally they called it the multi-interface working group. They changed it to, uh, to uh, I forget the name of it now, but uh, never, uh, never plumbing, I think is what they call it, the working group within, uh, within Kubernetes. Uh, but the, the initial version of it was that they wanted to provide multiple interfaces. And it's like, who actually cares about multiple interfaces? As a user, I don't care about it, about multiple interfaces. I care about, I need a fast, I need fast access to my, to my uh, storage. And I want to describe that I have, that I need this faster access somehow and how it gets rendered into the system. I don't care if it's all over the same interface, whether it's a different one, uh, if, if they if they found a way to make carrier pigeons work in a in a ethical way, uh, then I, I'm all in. <laughs> and so uh, it's it's not um, it, it's it's not a um, like you don't you want to be careful not to buy into things that are too low in, in this scenario. And I think that's it, it's a common it, it it's a common practice to do so, but there's there's consequences down the line as you start to as you start to try to scale these things up. And so. Um, and so I, I think describing what they need to connect to and the type of things that they need would, would be okay, but not necessarily describing down to like, I need this specific subnet ID or I need these particular, because uh, th those now you're making, now you're making uh, assumptions about the implementation that they may not be accurate. It's not a clear separation. Um, gentlemen, um, sounds like we will, we will not we will meet next year, I think, is our next um, point of collaboration. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great call. Any, any final requests or call to actions that people had had before we close out? Um, thank you, Frederick. Uh, Sunku, I think um, we may want to catch up a couple of Yep, I'll be working uh, this week, probably middle of next week. So yeah, happy okay. to catch up. 
Ian and Mike, uh, Blake, very thanks for coming, guys. Good to see you. Yeah, welcome. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Have a, have a happy new year. And you. Happy holidays. All right. Bye. Bye, guys.